Hey, what is going on my fellow human beings and welcome to another signal processing tutorial. In today's video, we are going to cover the bilinear transform. Now the bilinear transform is a method of converting an analog filter into its equivalent digital filter in a similar way to the impulse invariance method that we covered previously. So what is the bilinear transform? Well, the bilinear transform that you're familiar with, this term here, is actually derived from the bilinear approximation, which is found by making the substitution Z is equal to E to the power of ST, where S is a complex number and T is our sampling period, and then rearranging for S. Now don't worry, we'll get to this in a little bit, but before that, I'd like to first talk about how the S plane is mapped into the Z plane by making this bilinear approximation. So hopefully you're familiar with the fact that a filter in the S plane, if it has all of its poles in the left half plane here, it's going to be a stable filter. Likewise, for a digital filter, if it has all of its poles on the unit circle or within the unit circle, it's also going to be a stable filter. Now, we state that the bilinear transform is going to create a stable digital filter from a stable analog filter. So let's test that with a few points in the S plane here now. Firstly, let's take the point 0, 0. So this point here has a value of 0 in the real axis plus 0j in the imaginary axis. Now, if we substitute this into our bilinear approximation, we can see that we would have z is equal to e to the power of 0 plus 0 times t. Now, the sampling period doesn't actually impact the mapping of the system. So for now, we're just going to say that we have a t value of 1, so it makes things a little bit easier. So that leaves us with e to the power of 0, which is a value of 1 in the real axis. Therefore, this point here would map to this point here on the real axis in the z plane. Now let's choose another value on the imaginary axis. This time, let's choose a point at 0 plus 2j. And then we can substitute these values into our equation here again, and we would get e to the power of 0 plus 2j, which will just give us e to the power of 2j. Now, whenever we have e to the jw, we can use Euler's equations to relate this in terms of sines and cosines. So e to the j omega is simply equal to cosine of omega plus j sine omega. Now, as all of the values along the imaginary axis are going to have an alpha value of zero, this will always leave us with just e to the j omega, where omega will vary between negative infinity and positive infinity. Hopefully that you can see that if you take the magnitude of this equation, it's always going to be one, because cosine squared of any omega plus sine squared of any omega is equal to one. That means that the radius from the central point here in the z plane is always going to be one. So in this instance, we get a point that's approximately here. So from this, we can see that any value along the imaginary axis is going to map to the unit circle in the z-plane. Now we say that the points along this imaginary axis here give a marginally stable filter, as in it will oscillate forever. Now we get a similar result with the mapping to the z-plane here, because any value outside of this unit circle is going to cause an unstable filter, while all the values inside will cause a stable filter. Okay, so how about now we test a point here, which is given by negative 1 plus j. Now we already know that the plus j is going to give us a value which is on the unit circle. Therefore, the negative 1 in the alpha value here is going to determine the length of the arc. So mapping that, we get a value that is approximately here. So that's inside of our unit circle, which is what was expected because we were mapping a point which was in the left half plane, and the left half plane should map inside the unit circle. Okay, so lucky last, let's pick a point in the right half plane at this point here, which is 1 plus j. Now, as we have our plus j from before, we'll have our same angle here. However, we're now multiplying by e to the 1 which we know that e to the 1 is approximately 2.7, which means we're going to have a radius which is approximately 2.71, and that is outside of our unit circle. So if we had a pole in the right half plane, it would map to outside the unit circle in the z plane and indicate that the filter is unstable. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. If not, hopefully this will help. We can also think of this term here by z is equal to e to the a multiplied by e to the j, w. Now, 
We can do this because when we're multiplying, we can simply add the exponents. And just as before, we'll just assume that t is 1 because including it won't make the mapping any different. Then we can make the substitution z is equal to k e to the j w. So from this, we can see that k is acting as a scalar on the position of e to the j w. And e to the j w, or j omega, sorry, will always be on the unit circle. Therefore, the stability of the system will rely primarily on k. And doing this, we can draw the conclusion that when alpha is less than zero, we'll have a k value which is less than one. Likewise, if we have an alpha value which is larger than zero, we'll have a k value which is larger than one. Hopefully from this you can see that if we always have a magnitude of one with our e to the j omega, the k term out the front here can always be used to test if the filter is going to be stable or not. And if you think of this logically, all of the values in the left half plane here are going to have a negative a value, while all of the values in the right half plane here are going to have a positive a value, which gives us our stable and unstable filters. So hopefully you can see after all that mapping talk that the bilinear transfer will cause a stable digital filter to be created when applying it to a stable analog filter. Now we get down to the fun stuff and that is deriving our lovely S term here from our bilinear approximation. Now this is going to get a little bit hairy and we're going to use a Taylor series approximation uh, and a couple of other tiny bits of math that we might just skip over because it's not worth going into but I'll leave links down below if you'd like to read more into that to see how it actually works. So let's get started. Firstly you might be wondering, why do we want to rearrange this to get it in terms of S? Well, one, we need it in terms of S so we can substitute it into our analog filter. Secondly, we want it in this form specifically because this one minus z to the power of negative one and plus z to the power of negative one is extremely easy to implement in digital filters. So if we can get it in this form somehow using some black magic, uh, that's a really good thing. Okay, so here we go. If you have 2 to the power of 1, that could also be written as 2 to the power of a half divided by 2 to the power of negative a half because you could bring this up to the top, invert this sign, and then you would have 2 to the half multiplied by 2 to the half and just as before, you would add the exponents which would give us 2 to the power of 1. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, we're going to use the same idea to split up our e to the st value. That will give us z is equal to e to the st divided by 2 divided by e to the negative st divided by 2. Okay, so this is already looking a little bit better, a little bit closer to the form that we expect that we're used to. Okay, so we can then expand this out using Euler's and we'll get z is approximately equal to 1 plus st divided by 2 divided by 1 minus st divided by 2. Okay, so again, this is looking a fair bit closer to the form that we're expecting. Then, if we rearrange for s, we get s is equal to 1 on t times the natural log of z. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Here, we can use the Taylor series expansion of the natural log of z. Now, I'll leave a link down in the description for that one there, and that will give us 2 on t multiplied by the infinite series z minus 1 divided by z plus 1 plus 1 third z minus 1 divided by z plus 1 to the power of 3 plus 1 fifth z minus 1 divided by z plus 1 to the power of 5 and this goes on and on and on forever and then taking the limit as this approaches infinity we can get 2 divided by t multiplied by z minus 1 divided by z plus 1 now this is almost our final form and remember this is still for s so the next thing we can do if we want to get it into our final form is to divide top and bottom by z and that will give us 2 divided by t, 1 minus z to the power of negative 1. And that's because 1 divided by z is the same as flipping it up this way and then inverting the exponent divided by 1 plus z to the power of negative 1. And there we are. We've got our bilinear transform. So there's one other caveat to the bilinear transform, and that is the warping that occurs in the frequency domain when performing the transformation. Okay, so let's quickly go through that now. 
To see how the frequency is warped, we're going to substitute j omega in for s and e to the st in terms for z here, where s is equal to j omega, and then we'll equate the two omega values. For instance, s will become j omega a, as it's the omega a of our analog filter, and that's equal to 2 divided by t. The 1 stays the same, 1 minus, the z becomes e to the power of the negative stays there, j omega d, because that's the omega of our digital filter, and then that's multiplied by t. And then that's divided by 1 plus e to the negative j omega d multiplied by t. Hopefully you can see here there's not an exact relationship between omega a and omega d. Therefore, omega a is not equal to omega d. So, what can we do to remedy this? Well, we can rearrange to get this in terms of just omega a, and using Euler's again, we can make some cancellations which will give us omega a is equal to 2 on t, tan of omega d t on 2. And this is the formula that we use for our pre-warping. So hopefully now you can see where it comes from and how we calculate it. Okay guys, thanks for sticking through. I know this was a long video. The bilinear transform is quite a complex thing to get your head around. I actually was a bit hesitant to do this video because I wanted to make sure that I could convey it clearly because, I mean, there's nothing worse than being confused even more after watching a video. So, as always, thanks for watching, guys. If you had any problems at all, feel free to let me know with a comment down below. If you like this video, leave a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one where we'll go through an example of performing the bilinear transform.